Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean, and we also on our show have uh, my friend Gary, who if you are a regular listener, I will mention my friend that who owns uh, White Sox and Bull season tickets. This would be Gary. Yeah, it's not that glamorous. It is glamorous. Glamorous. They're partial season tickets. He's, he's being modest. It's glamorous. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today. Family friendly, affordable prices. We know the Blackhawks games are expensive if you are bringing your significant other and or children. The Rockford Ice Hogs tickets start $10. Uh, so only 90 minutes from the city limits. Fun for the whole family. Head on over to icehogs.com. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. All right, Alex, how have you been, my friend, since I saw you at the live show the other night? Oh, I've been great. I have been really, really great. And speaking of that live show, just kind of wanted to take this opportunity to once again thank the awesome guys from Ball Sports for hosting us. And it was a really, really great night. It was great finally meeting them in person. Two really awesome guys, Big Dave and C-Dub. Love you guys. Thanks again. Shout out to you. Uh, after you left, you missed it. The brewmaster came over and was excited to talk to us and then gave us a, uh, he gave us a whole breakdown of the brewing process and how to make beers taste differently and what a different amount of hops will taste like and then gave us taste tests of everything. Oh, why did I leave? That sounds awesome. Yeah, it was pretty awesome, but, uh, I think we were all a little a little tipsy by, by the end of it. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, all right. So this going to be an interesting show just because there's not a lot going on sports-wise. The Bulls are in uh, the All-Star break. The Blackhawks stink. Um, and baseball hasn't started yet. The pitchers and catchers are just uh, doing their workouts and the Bears are in uh, off season, and it's before that weird time when the draft. It's before the draft, before free agency starts. Uh, so, but we have a few topics we want to talk about. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to talk first. Just get out of the way. Is uh, the little bit of bears I wanted to bring up? All right. Um, so, Jason Lacanfora, who was uh, one of those news breaking. Uh, you know, tip type guys, um, kind of like Adam Schefter, except less good at it. Uh, he tweeted out a story basically saying that Kyle Fuller is not going to be a bear next year. Um, and I know there was a few people that kind of ran with the story as, uh, that are, you know, bigger bears, uh, podcasters and, and website runners, they ran with it, but then some other people really attacked him about it. Uh, and, and I thought it was a interesting story because I, I would love to know where the source of that came from. Yeah. I kind of wanted to know that as well. Now, is it completely surprising if that ends up being true? Not really, because we've seen what Kyle Fuller has done, and there's been a lot of injuries. There's been some inconsistency. And think about last year. A lot of people say he had a good year last year. And yeah, for a lot of the year last year, he had some really good games. Like the game against the Ravens, he was a monster that game. But there were also some times when Kyle Fuller looked pretty bad. 
So I'm not surprised by this, but like you said, I'd like to hear the source of this. Yeah, because it's it's Jason Lockham Four is not usually the one that breaks Bears news. Uh, right. His his track record with Bears news isn't isn't very good. Um, but my my thinking on it is all right. Well, you know the Bears declined the fifth year option on his because as a uh, I don't know if you everybody knows this or not, but if you are drafted in the first round of the NFL draft, uh, it's the contracts are for four years with a team option for a fifth year. And you have to uh, either pick up or decline the fifth year option prior to the fourth year of play. So this year, before the season starts, the Bears have to make the decision on whether or not they pick up Kevin White's fifth year uh, option. But prior to last season is when they had to make the decision on Kyle Fuller and they opted to not pick it up because he had spent the entire season before with um, that mystery ailment that people thought he was only going to be out for a couple of weeks and ended up missing the whole season. Right. So the Bears had the option to pick up that option before the season didn't, uh, and he ended up coming out and playing really well this year. But my my thing about it is, uh, you know, I, I get maybe Jason Lockon Fora has some sort of um, I don't know, in with somebody, but it's weird because Kyle Fuller is usually very, very quiet and you don't hear much from him. Even, uh, when he had the mystery illness, like you, the ailment, you, you didn't hear anything. There was no rumors about it because he's pretty quiet. So to get the story is a little weird, but also is it's the bears choice for the most part is the bears have the ability to, to franchise tag him or transition tag him if they want and uh and they could bring him back so it's it's not like he you know saying he's absolutely going to leave is a pretty bold statement for a guy that uh on a team that's desperate in need of bringing at least one of those two starting cornerbacks back and has the money to be able to do it yeah i just my only theory is is that the bears and him already talked and they wanted to part ways, but I'd be pretty surprised if they came to that conclusion already. Like that that's the thing that gets me is that this is coming out in mid-February. It's not more down the road. So I, I don't know. Right now, I'm just gonna kind of wait it out because I can't really say that I trust this fully. I'm not gonna completely disregard it because hey, maybe it's true, but like you said, I just don't think we have enough information here. Yeah, Gary just pulled up an article um, from uh, Sports Mockery. Uh, and uh, it says that, for the most part, that uh, Lock on 4 isn't known for his precise accuracy with these kind of predictions. Um, but he says often enough – he's hits often enough to at least be taken seriously. And the likelihood of a long-term extension getting done with Fuller at this point feels right. unlikely. The two sides are probably too far apart on numbers. However, it doesn't automatically mean Fuller is leaving. Chicago still has the franchise tag in their back pocket. And yeah, that's pretty much my thoughts on it as well. Uh, I'm imagining uh, Fuller probably wants at this point. I mean, it's the, the, the free agency period hasn't even started. So I'm imagining he's in his camp or talking $10 million a year range or more and a, a long-term contract with huge uh, guarantees. But, I, you know, I, I don't know if the Bears want to commit to that. With the franchise tag, sure, they're paying him more per that one year than they want to, but it gives them another year to see, hey, is he was last year a fluke or was the year before the fluke? It's kind of reminding me of the Alshon Jeffrey ordeal that, you know, when he was going into that year, a lot of people, including myself, called for the franchise tag because we wanted to see if he was going to stay healthy and if he was going to be effective when healthy. And this is kind of how I feel with Kyle, uh, Kyle Fuller here. Uh, I think the franchise tag to me seems like the most likely way to bring him back right now because I really don't see the Bears giving him that huge deal. And with with Alshon, I mean, they did that. They gave him the one year franchise tag and paid him a ton of money. 
but the the problem but it was, for was the that one year. yeah it was for the it was the year and he, they were like all right well he's either going to show us he's not worth it or he's going to show us he's worth it and we'll give him the money and he he looked good when he was there but then missed a bunch of time with uh, injuries that just seemed like most players would probably play through like and wasn't there a suspension too in there for Alshon, I don't remember there being a suspension. Um, well, I know there was for Jerome was, Freeman, but oh know. yeah, he's had a couple. Uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah, Alshon had like you know a, a strained calf and tight hamstrings, and it was all soft tissue injuries. No, you know most of the time you you expect an NFL player to uh, um to be able to uh, play through that. And, and oh, Gary, do you want to chime in with this? No, I just pulled something up. Uh, Alshon Jeffrey is suspended for performance enhancing drug violation. Uh, this happened November of 2016. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, and I do remember that now. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, it, it just seemed like they gave him that money. He still didn't want to be here, uh, and and you never fully saw whether or not a give him the money because he's showing he's worth it or he's a flop and let him go. My worry with Kyle Fuller is, uh, is that if you let him walk because he doesn't want to be here or whatever the situation is, if he doesn't want to be here, you still need to replace him. You can't go in uh, with another situation where you don't bring any corners in. Uh, there, otherwise, it's going to be this coming year's. Um, uh, it's going to be this year's wide receiver position. I mean, yeah, the way I see it is if they're not going to bring back Kyle Fuller and like how I mentioned how he had the inconsistency and the injuries, if they really don't feel like he's even worth bringing back for another year, even on a franchise tag, uh, then I would uh, assume that they'd have some sort of other plan. I don't know what that is. I mean, obviously, they'd probably draft a guy. They could probably sign a guy. I just don't know who exactly that's going to be. So I would imagine there would be a plan in place if that were the case. And again, like right now, like I said earlier, I'm kind of up in the air on the situation. Would I be surprised they moved on from him? No, because of the reasons I said. But at the same time, what you said is you're going to need to have to put someone in the cornerback position. I mean, let's face it, the secondary has lacked for years. So you wanted to be as strong as you can. So... I, I just I could see this going in a number of directions, except for one, and that's a long term deal. I just I guarantee you the Bears are not going to give him a long term deal. Who are the other uh, cornerbacks? Uh, Prince I'm a- M- M- Prince Mukamara is uh, he's a free agent as well. Yeah, um, Marcus Cooper was awful gone. this year. Uh, you've, yeah, you've got Bryce Callahan. Um, you've got. Uh, who was the guy they picked up from New England? Um, well, Quentin Demps is gone, oh right, goodness. from te- the Texans. He's no, no, he was just hurt. He, but he was a safety. Oh, that's so right, he was a safety. Uh, you've got. Um, he was hurt all year, that's but right. he'll be back this year. Uh, um, you, you've got a bunch of backups, basically. Uh, there's nobody that's just that I would feel comfortable with stepping up to being the uh, the man. Um. Tracy Porter. He's gone. No, yeah. Porter's gone. Uh, you, uh, I mean, you need to bring Amukamara or Fuller back. I mean, Amukamara probably is your easiest, easier target to bring in because uh, he was on a prove it deal last year. Sure, McManus. Um, he's a special teamer. Um, let's see who else. Um, Cravon LeBlanc. But he's he's been a, a dime guy that you don't you know you don't expect him to step up. Bryce Callahan did some nice things, but he also is um, injury prone. So you can't really rely on him to to be a, a step up and be a starter. So you need to bring back Fuller or Mukamara, if not both. And and you know you don't want to put yourself in the situation like you did with wide receivers, where you let a really good guy go and replace him with a bunch of let's cross our fingers guys. Yeah, I think Ryan Pace has realized by this point that he can't play that game anymore. Hopefully he's realized. Yeah, hopefully. That's my hopefully. worry. He's hopefully. 
Uh, yeah. So I, I, it's, I really hope I really like where both cornerbacks played last year. I, I liked it a lot. Um, it would be nice to bring back a Mukamara on like a three-year deal and, and then saw, signed Kyle Fuller to a, a longer deal. Um, that would be my ideal situation because you have the money and you can, and you have the money, you can be able to front load those contracts and give them guarantees because, uh, you know, it's going to, it's going to be more fruitful to you in a couple of years when, when you're competing and you're not uh, bogged down by back-ended contracts. Yeah, their flexibility is really nice in terms of cap space. And like we said on previous shows, they're going to free up more of that because the reports are all saying Mike Lennon's not going to be back. Um, yeah, I mean, I could have told you that. You could have told me that. Not surprising. Uh, Ray Charles saw that one coming. Oh. Boom. Boom. Uh, <laughs> All right, just switching gears a little bit. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about uh, the topic that you had uh, sent me or if you want to talk about the, uh, the 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 story that I sent you earlier today. Um, well, I know what I want to talk about. Or if really you want quick. to talk about the... Can we just, can we just nail the, what happened at the United Center? Can we just get to that and say our piece? Yeah. Yeah, I... I, I before that incident happened, I wasn't even going to talk about the Blackhawks because uh, they they stunk and they had one really good game against the Capitals, which is weird that they have a good game against the Capitals. Um, but I missed the game. I had other things going on. Um, as did you? No, I saw it. Uh, oh no, sorry, that was the night after. That was the night after. I was thinking the um, it was the night rush, uh, but uh, I missed it. I had something going on and. I woke up the next day to see um, an apology from the Blackhawks, and I'm like, oh, man, what happened? Um, and for those that don't know, uh, that the Washington Capitals forward, Devontae smith um was in the penalty box for, for fighting, and he was taunted by four, at least four Blackhawks fans. Um and they were they were shouting. The words themselves were not offensive, but the the connotation that they were screaming basketball, basketball, basketball at him. And and I, I they the fans were the quote fans uh, were were removed from the stadium, and the Blackhawks quickly issued an apology. Look, I'm just glad that it was all taken care of swiftly, and that it didn't escalate even worse. I'm completely embarrassed as a Blackhawks fan that something like that happened and nobody should be saying that stuff to anybody. It's racist. It's hurtful. It's just not classy whatsoever. But good for the other fans reporting the problem right away. Good for the Blackhawks uh, security guys or whoever works at the United Center there for removing those people right away. And good for the Blackhawks for apolog apologizing right away. And the fact that us fans now have to go out and say, don't let these people represent us really sucks because it paints a bad picture for our fan base. I don't want to be associated with racism like that. It's not fair to everyone else who is not a racist. It was just a terrible, terrible thing to happen. And those people, whoever they were, I, I don't acknowledge them as true members of our fan base. Hopefully they don't get to go back and hopefully we won't have to deal with them again. Um, it, I was just, I was really upset by that because finally the Blackhawks have a nice game and you could kind of relax and say, all right, yeah, we may not be going to the playoffs, but at least we finally got to see them play a really good game again. And then it's got to be ruined by some awful people who say awful things. Yeah, I just, it was so upsetting. It's like, really? Come on. I totally, I have a, I have a general rule of thumb and it's, don't oh, read God. the comments. Don't even give me start on that. Uh, uh, anything on the internet. I, and I I made the mistake of reading the comments because I I figured it was going to be apologetic Blackhawks fans and then fans of every other team jumping down our throats saying how bad Blackhawks fans were. And I was like, I'm like this is going to be safe enough. Nobody's going to agree with this. And boy, was I wrong. 
Uh, well, first of all, it was only St. Louis fans that were bashing Blackhawks fans, which is what they do because they don't win. So might as well bash somebody that does win. Boom. Roasted. Uh, but there was so many people defending the comments. Oh, boy. And saying, oh, oh. Ba- basketball is a racist word now. No. It, how do people not understand this? It's not so much the word itself. It's not like they, they yelled – the N word, um, but the connotation that they were they were saying it with mm-hmm. is clearly it was discriminatory intent overtones to it like that. How? Yeah, you are clearly singling this player, this one player out because he's black. I I don't understand that. Is just, you know you can say racially charged things without actually saying a specific denoted racist word right i mean people shout ha ha you stink in a joking way and it's i mean it's one thing to do that but to make racist implications like that that's never okay and that's cause for ejection and like i said yeah. good for them for taking care of that right away because could you imagine if they would have stuck around what more they could have said you don't know they could have made it 10 times worse and and the thing is, is I would say hockey has some of the more meatball fans overall, um, just because of the way the sport ha- was previously, in, you know, the the eighties and earlier. But overall, the league itself is probably one of the more progressive as far as is um, being inclusive. Is uh, you know, we can remember a. a uh, a certain former player who was suspended for using a, a gay slur on the ice. Yeah, that was in um, the playoffs, wasn't it? Yeah, it's they've they've been the NHL has been very proactive as far as uh, not not using language on the ice uh, that's derogatory, uh, you know, discriminatory as far as race sexual orientation, things like that. They've been really progressive on that. And and you got to, sometimes you can bang on uh, Gary Bettman for a lot of things, but that's not one of them. That's one you just got to fist bump them on. Yeah. And it's kind of nice to see as hockey's kind of growing in some cities, you're seeing more diverse people get interested in it. And I'm like, I think that's great. I think it's great that they can make environments that are welcoming for all people and unfortunately, last night, the United Center, they didn't show that with what those fans said. And that's also what kind of got me angry. It's like, come on, we're starting to be more inclusive here of other people. And we're starting to embrace all people as we should be. And then that happens. It's like, are you really going to hurt that progress? Like, come on. Yeah, it, it was it was really a frustrating situation. And it really... Uh, puts a black eye on on Blackhawks and Blackhawks fans. Um, and I, would, I would disagree with that. I don't... You think you don't think so? I mean, I don't think all Blackhawks Hawks fans should be stereotyped in that way. I think, I think if anything, it shows that the Blackhawks did what they should have done and, and they, they acted correctly, like Alex was saying. And, you know, and... Don't read the comments. Well, yeah, I don't. Use your own advice. Yeah, I don't read the comments. But for every anything, article I've seen, never read the yeah, comments. I know. It, I mean, you could you could have a, a article about um, you know child art prodigy paints recreation of Mona Lisa, and if you read the comments, somebody's somebody's going to say something racist. <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, every art. Th- my point is that every article is. Blackhawks fans say racial things, uh, you know, against a player, and it's just like it just makes you like not want to read hockey news for the next week. And the way they word it, it's like the way they word it. It sounds like the whole arena was getting up and saying, shouting racist things. No, the people around the people who were being racist were calling them out and getting security so they can get them out. I just I think that paints a bad picture right there. Yeah, I just I just worry. I don't ever want to be, you know, in the same breath as a, a Philadelphia fan. Nah, I I I understand. 
<laughs> I, I mean, th- so you didn't like the way they celebrated when they won, huh? I mean, they ate horse poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so anybody, that listens to this show, anybody that know, listens to this show uh, probably knows that my wife is from philadelphia so uh the, like a day or two after the eagles won i was on my mother-in-law called and i was like so did you eat some celebratory horse poop and she was like she was like nobody does that i was like yeah, they did. She's like, no, that's just a made up story to, to make Philadelphia fans look bad. I sent her the video. She didn't comment anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I I just I know we've talked about this before, but I still I just need I need to understand is is you know, I spent my entire life and I'm I'm much older than Alex, but so it's I know Alex has spent his entire life too waiting for a Cubs World Series. My life has been longer. I've waited longer. When you, they won, you I had, you had to do with me celebrating for my team winning as well before uh, you, your team won. But I, <laughs> I was I was probably it was one of the happiest days of my entire life, and never, never even for a split second did I think, man, I'm just so happy I could eat horse poop. Yeah, I can't say that the day after the Cubs won or when the Blackhawks won all those championships. The next day, I thought, I want to have a nice celebratory dinner. After the Cubs won, I actually had a nice lunch with my mom at Harry Carey's the next day. Chicken parm, uh, spaghetti, that was great. Not not horse crap. Nah. Yeah, nah. yeah after, after the Blackhawks won their last Stanley Cup, like... I'm like, oh man, my first thought is I'm going to go down to the corner of Harlem and Addison because I know people are, you know, it's going to be a mini parade and everyone was out honking and high-fiving and and there was no horse poop consumed. I saw it. There was none, none horse poop consumed. That's and good. I was like, and now I think about it as next time I have a celebration to go to is, you know, next team in Chicago that wins, uh, I'm going to go and, and know that we are proud enough fans that we will just eat food and not manure. Yeah. I, and I, I, if, if the, the Cubs win another world series or the bears win a super bowl or the, the bulls win a championship, whatever, whatever happens, I really don't think I'm ever going to be tempted to do that. <laughs> I, I mean, I get so nervous during games that I don't want to eat anything. So the thought of eating poop is just even worse. <laughs> This is on top of all the riots, right? This is on top of the riots. I, I mean, the riots were, you know, you knew that was going to happen is climbing poles and flipping cars and burning the city down. But the, the, the poop that. was. The, 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 yeah, we all, everybody in the world saw that coming, except <laughs> the poop. The poop was the one that, that I just. All right. It's Can't wait so for the absurd. Always Sunny in Philadelphia episode. <laughs> uh. It's so gross, but right. it's so absurd. It's and, and somebody's like, "Well, why did you watch the whole video?" And I was like, "Well, I needed to confirm that he actually ate it and not just, you know, talked about it. I, I needed to confirm that he put it in his mouth and shoot it up and went num 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 num." So, so not to get into specifics, but but did he like fully eat it, or did he start gagging, or no, he put it in his mouth chewed it up and everyone started cheering and he threw his hands up in celebration. Did he swallow it? I, I don't know. They stopped the video, but I'm guessing. Yeah. He, I mean, he didn't seem grossed out by it at all. God. There, there was, I mean, there was not even, an, nobody and nobody in the crowd was grossed out. Nobody was like gross. They were all like, <laughs> eat it, eat that poop. <laughs> S- sorry to get in specifics, but like my son hands me his poop and I get grossed out. I can't imagine... Yeah, and, and no, and there's probably zero thought in going. Man, this looks delicious. I'm gonna nom on this. We should have made a disclaimer at the beginning of the show. Be sure you're not eating during this. Don't yeah, don't eat. Don't ever eat during the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Yeah. So I don't going full circle. I just don't want to be lumped in with those fans. Like I don't. I don't want to be the fans that like. Are we're awful and we're lumped in with poop eaters? Yeah. 
Uh, so, um, there was, you know, switching gears a bit. I sent you an article uh, a little bit ago today um, about Bulls uh, big man Cristiano Felicio, um, and Gary actually is the one that sent me this article. I didn't, I didn't know this story. Um, I didn't to give either. to give a little, to give a little background is so. Uh, Felicio is from Brazil, and apparently he came over uh, to the United States to play in in on an AAU team, and uh, and it was in the suburbs of Sacramento, California. So this is this is not like it's a third world country or some. It's this is this is in the United States. This is in the capital of California, and. The the head of this AAU team um, was abusing players. Uh, the foreign players were he uh, would tear up their passports and, um, and threaten to you know if they told players if they would leave that he would uh, report them to the police and they'd be arrested for being in this country illegally. Um, he was starving players. He was threatening them with guns. It was an awful, awful situation. I had no idea. I had no idea either. And when I read it, I was shocked. Like all those things you listed. Hey, could you imagine going through that? That just, that sounds like hell. I mean, it's bad enough to go through that, but just think like these are, these are kids. These are not grown adults. These are kids. And most of them are kids from other countries. Like they don't. Like, this is not their first language. This is not, you know, this is not a country they've been to. They're in a foreign country, speaks a different language, and they're being starved and threatened with guns and threatened with arrest. That's that's awful. And it, it's like they they don't know where to go. They don't know who to seek. They're they're trapped in this horrible horrible situation. Gary, did you know about this before you read that article? Uh, I heard about it and then got the link to the article. It, you know, it just, the whole story gives me a whole, a uh, new appreciation for Felicio. And it's not even that, it, besides having that horrific experience, everything that happened after that, how he got a letter of acceptance in Oregon and, and couldn't go because of some of the time he would play professionally in Brazil. And how he, literally someone did a, a favor to have him come to the Bulls summer camp. And that's how he made his way to Bulls. I mean, the whole story, like including what happened in that in that person's house. His name is Francis Anide Nagisa. I mean, it's just my I, I had my wife read it and she even got heartbroken over it. Like it was yeah, it was. It's just sad, and and I mean, luckily, it all has a happy ending where Felicio made a lot of money. Um, but I mean, this really very easily could have been a horror story, and then him going back to Brazil and, uh, you know, just been a regular Brazilian person, like you know, having to to go get a regular job or 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 find his way to playing overseas or something. But well, I, he, he also didn't get the brunt of the torture because he was bigger um but he got the mental abuse a lot if you read this article it, it, i mean that for a young teenage kid that's still a lot that's still a lot but at the same time you know these other kids what they had to go through yeah some i mean the the article doesn't go into the specifics of what what actually happened but um the the guy the guy got a 10 year prison sentence and has to register as a sex offender. So like God only knows what was happening behind closed doors. And uh, you know, they, they keep saying in the article that Felicio didn't get the physical brunt because a, he was, he was so much bigger than everybody else. Um, and B is that, you know, he was at the time going to be offered a scholarship to play at Oregon and that was going to legitimize this guy's AAU team uh, so he could bring more players in. Yeah, 
I guess the only other scary thing about this is where else is this happening? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that they had, uh, you know, teachers coming in and was under supervision of like the Sacramento school system, and and the the people that were were going in and checking, like they they didn't think that things were totally on the up and up, but nothing like where they needed to get police involvement and child protective services, and so uh, imagine one that's even shadier where it doesn't have any supervision and they're just, they're maintaining this. Yeah. I mean, think about how much corruption has come out over the years in all different levels of sports. And when you hear stories like this come out, like Gary said, who knows where else this is happening? I mean, at the rate we're hearing about this, it's really disturbing and sad to think, but you got to think that this isn't the only case of this. I bet there are other places that are going through similar things like this, and you just hope that more and more of it comes out so we can put an end to this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, a different uh, action, but a similar, uh, you know, type horrific story is what Michigan State is doing, where they the, the whole university is suppressed – uh, a one of their doctors from sexually abusing like 250 women and girls and then suppressed uh, football and basketball player stories of, of sexual assault. I, I mean, that is a one of the largest universe and most respected universities in this country. And the whole university covered it up. Yeah. And, you know, you, you like to believe that this was one scumbag uh, doing this to, uh, you know, some kids, but the, the other story is an entire university and, uh, you know, voted in officials just covering it all up. Yeah. It just, it goes to show that there are a lot of people in on these things and you don't know an organization like you think, you know, them. And it's it just scary to think, that how how often this probably happens that nobody ever knows and the things people probably have to endure and and the cover-ups of things because of how influential and profitable sports are yeah yeah it's it's really sad to think about how how many kids could be going through this kind of thing and as a parent it's got to scare you when you hear more and more of this wouldn't you think Oh, absolutely. I mean, part of me is thrilled that my son doesn't look like he's excelling in sports. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you don't, you can't trust sports doctors. You can't trust uh, coaches. You can't trust uh, other parents. And, and it's funny because you think about, you think about like Canadian, like uh, youth hockey um, and like parents will just send their kids off to live with, hockey parents that are in whatever city they're playing in and they live with, live with these people for months on end. And, uh, you know, you don't hear horror stories about that. So is it something about what happened in this country or is it those stories are just masked? Yeah. I just, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I, I have a related story. Uh, someone in, so I play baseball and I, my games. He like, plays in an old man league. Hey, it's 18 and older. Dude. <laughs> but I am one of the old men in it. Um, and we, we were playing at Wheeling Park, um, Heritage Park. I'm sorry. It's in Wheeling. It's called Heritage Park. And there's four diamonds and they're all turf fields. And so you usually have a lot of traveling kids baseball. Mm -hmm. teams play there because the fields are nice and the and they they can play you know in bad weather and i mean just to see how these coaches treat these kids like how they how they yell how they're very strict how you know they teach these kids that are 10 12 years old you have to throw your curveball and it's it just makes me as someone who appreciates sports and loves playing baseball and going to baseball games I'm not going to subject my children to that, but I actually think it's a norm. So when you hear stories like with what happened to Felicio, I mean, it 
it's more common, like not maybe not to the extent, but like the abuse that children get. I think that's a very common part of competitive sports yeah. for, for kids. I mean, even not an abuse situation, but to go with the extent of how how parents will take their youth sports for their kids is Bryce Harper didn't finish high school. Bryce Harper dropped out of high school and got his GED so he can play baseball full time. Makes me uh, appreciate Bryce Harper's dad a little less. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I mean, I, I, I have a kid, Gary's got two, I've got one. And all I want is, you know, to, I mean, I guess, Make some hints ways I could see it because he he probably wants what's best for his kid and he thought that was what was best is making him play a baseball player. But it's it's hard to it's hard for me to rationalize that you know getting your kid their education isn't the the best route even even if they look like they're excelling at something else. So what are your feelings on Lavar Ball? I think he's a dirt ball, and I mean I I mean I get he. On one hand, I can sort of appreciate because he he doesn't want his kids to be taken advantage of, whether it's by Nike Reebok, so he starts as a big baller brand, or by a university, so he pulled them out of UCLA. But taking your kids and, and moving them to a country where they don't speak the language um, and they're they're outside of, of you know, their norm of their normal society it's i i just i just can't understand that it just doesn't make sense to me well the way i see it is even if you look like you're going to become a big famous athlete that's going to make enough money to last a lifetime there's no guarantee that every high school star is going to turn into a professional athlete and if you pull them out before they finish high school i mean that's a huge risk right there it, like this is just my opinion. I'm I'm not a parent. I'm still very young, but it's always been my opinion that everyone should at least try to get a high school diploma. I, I mean, it, it, to me, it just kind of makes. Sense. I mean, it, it, yeah, at least with Lemon Jello and whatever Lavar's other kids are named, uh, like, uh, you know, their older brother is in the NBA and he's making money. So if if things don't work out. It's not like they're going to be living in the streets, but uh, what about a? What if this would he would have done this with his first kid, like and um, uh, the kid wouldn't have succeeded? That then, then where do they go from there? Well, you know he wants to. St- well, like Bryce Harper. What if Bryce Harper didn't succeed? He'd have been a guy that didn't finish high school, pumping gas in his town. You know, Lavar Ball wants to start one of these programs for kids as well. His goal is to not have kids go to college, but go through his system, kind of like a, a what a developmental league. And this this puts us into that, you know, a sort of a tangent here. But I, I know a lot of people call for uh, colleges to pay athletes, and I it's on one hand it makes sense from a surface level. You're like, all right, well these kids are are doing all of the the, the big lifting to, you know, to bring money into these programs. And uh, I think I just saw CBS signed a, f- a contract with the NCA to broadcast the, the March Madness for a, over a billion dollars a year, one billion, $1.1 billion a year. So, so you know, on some level, you're like, well, why aren't these kids getting paid? But then, you know, if you really break it down and, and look at it, if you pull statistics from the NCAA, is the sports programs as a whole, there's only like five programs that are actually profitable if you include all of their sports programs overall. Um, and it's like Alabama, uh, Texas, um, maybe Ohio State. There's like five programs. Most of them lose money. The basketball, football, for the most part, are profitable, but uh, baseball is not profitable at all. Hockey's not profitable. Women's sports aren't profitable. Swimming's not profitable. Track and field not profitable. And um, and then you know you could be like, well, 
if you want to pay athletes, you sort of have to go, well, then we have to cut sports because Title IX, um, it grants equality for women's sports. But if you read the the the, the, the whole uh, wording, it grants equality to all sports. So if you offer swimming or track and field, you can't you can't be like, well, we're going to pay the football players, but not the the curling team. If you have a curling team, you got to pay them too. And if you have right. men's sports, you have to have women's sports, and so you have to pay them the same amount, um, or else it's a Title IX violation. So you're not just paying these ten basketball players on your team. Um, you're paying you're paying you know 400, 500 athletes or more that are uh, going to your university. And that's that's cost prohibitive because most of these schools are losing money. If that became the thing, school team uh, big time players would only go to schools that would pay them and you would have an even more top heavy basketball and football league than we already do. Technically, isn't that what they do? Well, I mean, we the uh, if if the allegations that uh, are happening in NCA are true, then yes, it already is happening. Uh, Quentin Richardson, I could say that from. Did you read that his, article? Uh, his he wrote a a blog. Oh, for uh, the the Players Tribune. Yeah, it it was actually really. I was really impressed from what I remember of Quentin from back in school. I was really impressed with the article and what happened and how he reviews his career. Uh, I mean, I remember he drove around in a, like a big old SUV, brand new SUV that Pat Kennedy. that he, uh, he definitely, you know, based on where his family came from, probably could not afford. Yeah, but he would always, he, you should read, I'll, I'll send you that blog and, you too, Alex. If you want? Uh, he he would he was very homebody, and he would go to his father's house every day after practice at the Paul. And then I believe his brother died, and that and it was murdered, and that really affected him negatively. Yeah, um, wow. after he went pro, um, it, it it's just you know when people open up, you, you see the other side of things. And I remember Quentin Richardson who wanted to compete with me in bowling because I threw harder than him. Um, I tutored him. Um, but I mean, reading that blog, I was really impressed by the kind of person he is now. Um, yeah. That's and how he got to her. Uh, tr true story is, uh, yeah, I tutored Quentin Richardson at the hall, um, is being a, uh, a tutor, an academic tutor for the uh, the athletics department, paid a whole lot more than tutoring anybody else, and but it was really hard to get into, and I got sort of backdoored into it because one of the women's softball players was a chemistry major, which was what my major was, and she needed help in a course, so they went to the department. And they were like, "Who who could tutor her? Who's qualified?" And they were like, "Sean." And they're like, anybody else? No, Sean. And so they're like, well, we get we have to hire him. So they then I got into the pool. I could tutor other athletes because I was in the on the payroll there, and it paid. This was, you know, I don't know if I want to say the year, but it was it was uh many many ninety eight earlier than that. It was like ninety. I think it was ninety seven when I started. That. Right. Um, but uh, they were paying they were paying twenty dollars an hour in the nineties. That's amazing. Yeah. So I was hey, like, did you have work study? Wow. Yeah. Oh. So, Jealous. so yeah, they were paying $20 an hour in the nineties. I think that, you know, just for inflation is like $7 million an hour. And today's well, work study, you don't get taxed. So it was a double benefit. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty awesome. I got state tax, uh, but yeah, but you get the point. So it was, it was nice. Uh, so it was like basically free money because they to tutor someone who probably had a pro production to the NBA anyway. So yeah. It's like, and it's funny because my wife's like, Oh, do you think you remember you? Nope. Zero percent chance they remember me. Like he dated he dated Moesha. He doesn't remember me. Brandy. Yeah. Sorry, we're going back in time. No, that's fine. Alex. Yeah, sorry, old talk. Um so you had a topic that you wanted to discuss. 
and it's an interesting topic. So I, I, I want to, I want to introduce that. So do you want to go ahead and um, bring it up, Alex? Yes. So there's been a lot of talk among many fans of pretty much every major sports league, and it's all about tanking. And there's a lot of the ethical thoughts about tanking, whether it's right or not. And this came up again on Saturday morning. I was listening to ESPN 1000. It was uh, Murph and Fred, and they brought up the Bulls. And I think their Twitter poll was about what they should do the rest of the year. And obviously the big vote was to tank the rest of the way. And I've been all about the tank this year because, well, you want a good draft pick or the best chance at a good draft pick. Obviously, we know that there are issues ethical that some people could bring up. So my question is, how could we develop a system that would eliminate tanking? And there are a few ideas out there that are interesting. At the end of the day, though, there's always going to be some sort of little flaw with it. It Yeah, tank. Um, so tanking is... is uh, especially a big topic right now because in basketball in the NBA there is I mean there's bad teams but then there's teams that are just absolutely competing to get the the most lottery balls um and those teams are it's going to be hard to outlose them yeah definitely and fans who pay money will say mm-hmm. well I came here and they're benching guys to to tank and you know we don't like it and I'm not sure they like it. I mean one point I will make about this season is if you bought tickets for the Bulls, you knew they were going to be bad. So but it, at least the Bulls and I didn't think it was going to be the, like this. They're this is the most fun I've had watching Bulls basketball in several years. Oh, I I don't disagree with you at all. I I'm completely with you on that. I'm but just imagine saying- Imagine a team like Orlando. Orlando had the Bulls, like a victory against the Bulls, and they just were like, oh, we can't win this game. Here, let me just pass the inbounds pass to Zach Levine so yeah. he can dunk it on our faces. Yeah. Like that's that's the level of losing that they're at. Like the Bulls, like you, you're not – there's no way you're going to say that Laurie Markkinen and – Zach Levine aren't trying to win those games. Well, oh, the Bulls are never going to do. Sorry, the Bulls are never going to do what Orlando did. They, Orlando traded Oladipo before he became who he is, and they probably shouldn't have done that. They traded him for peanuts. Uh, well, Orlando, Orlando hasn't done a lot of smart moves in a long time. That's why they've been bad for quite some time. But yeah, I mean, basketball tried to curb things by doing the the lottery system where you know they have a certain number of ping pong balls and the worst teams gets the better odds but uh, that doesn't always hold true i mean look at the 86 knicks you know d- well, that, Derek that was, rolls of the, the yeah, 86 that knicks that was a total fix that was a fix <laughs> but i mean orlando when they uh they had the, the they were the best team in the lottery and and got uh um Oh my God! What's his name from Michigan? Uh, and then they traded him for Penny Hardaway. Ooh. Um. Oh my goodness! Wow. Gary, you're having an old man moment too. Played for Michigan. He was the best on the Fab Five. Weber. Chris Weber. When they got they had the worst odds, and they got Chris Weber. The year after they got Shaq. So, I, I mean, but those those things are rare. Like. It, it's nice when a team with the worst odds gets the, the the number one pick because it's it's introducing new teams to compete the next year. Yeah, but then you have something like the Spurs where they had David Robinson. He is out for the season. They have the worst work record, and then they get Tim Duncan. Uh, the Colts getting Andrew Luck when they had Peyton Manning. So it's it, you know I, I I agree. This is a really interesting topic, and um. NFL, you, you, I don't think you see a lot of tanking because teams really are competing. Yeah, I agree. But, but baseball, baseball and basketball teams are 
teams are definitely tanking. And baseball's a little easier to mask it because they they just go, oh, we're rebuilding, and and the front office just puts bad teams on the field. But basketball, like it's like you, I don't know. It just it's it seems like everybody's involved in the tanking and players included. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean Orlando wasn't playing. No, sorry. go ahead. I was say Orlando wasn't playing four of their starters against the Bulls at the end of the game, so. Yeah, and they they gave them the inbound pass. I mean, you watch watch, you know. I I, I don't know the schedules of the, some of these teams, but if you see a Dallas Phoenix game this, you know, in the next few weeks, it is going to be like that South Park episode where the kids didn't want to play baseball anymore, so they were all yeah. trying to lose, so they didn't have to play further in the tournament. That's what you're going to see. Is you're going to see teams that just try and out suck each other, and coaches trying to put substitution patterns in there to uh, to make it worse. I mean, the Bulls are trying to do it a little bit. But like, How often do you see Larry Markin in the fourth quarter? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot more strategy, like flat-out strategy by like the teams in basketball to tank. Because with baseball, honestly, it's kind of like Major League where – if they're winning, they'll just trade away pieces to start losing where the front office will just kind of take over. Uh, they'll put a team together that's going to suck. And then uh, if they want to keep sucking more, then they'll replace players with someone who will suck. I mean, that's, that's true. You know, you're uh, and, I, and I don't know how you fix that. Like, I don't what's the what's what's the fix for this? Um, well, there's a few things that people have brought up, a few different theories. I don't know if either of you have read into it uh, at all. I, I can definitely say I, I, um, I haven't read into it. I have not either. Yeah, I mean, it's th there's just a bunch of like different ways people have proposed to fix it. Like uh, for basketball, one was, and, and again, there's still going to be flaws with this. Some just say, just have a flat out lottery. And you just you draw you draw names. It's everyone's equal chance. Um, I think there'd be some problems with that. And another thing with that is trading draft picks in basketball and football and hockey is a big part of a front office. Obviously, you don't see it in baseball because you don't do it in baseball. But if you trade picks with someone before a draft, and that's when they do the lottery, you don't know what area you're going to be picking in. It's like well. I could trade you this draft pick and that draft pick may end up being lucky, like a, a top pick that you didn't expect. So there's also been propositions of like, well, you have the first 10 rounds with the 10 worst teams and everyone has like the, t the 10 worst records and everyone just has a ball and you just pick. There, there's no certain amount of balls. You just say, all right, here are the 10 worst teams. These are going to be the 10 first slots in the draft, and we're just going to pick at random. It could be the 10th worst team. It could be the worst team. But when you're like a top bottom feeding team, you're not going to be motivated to tank as much unless you're in the middle ground. So that's where more controversy comes in because you could try to tank to be a bottom 10 team but they would say, quote unquote, eliminates the tank for like being one of the worst teams. So this is no easy fix. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think I heard somebody on the radio say that um, they would like to see it where the team, uh, the, the teams that don't make the playoffs in the NBA, uh, it's the reverse number of balls. So the the team that just misses out will get the the number highest number of balls. Um and and I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense either because if you're like, oh man, I'm gonna be the last seed in have to play Golden State, aren't I way better off by losing these last couple of games right. and getting the best opportunity for the number one pick rather than just getting creamed by Golden State? Right, exactly. Exactly. Gary, you're you're my NBA guy. What, what how do they fix this? So, I mean, I have a, I have a different perspective. I think um, a lot of people ridiculed me for supporting the Bulls for many years when they were bad, uh, as well as, you know, even recently, you know, when 
Butler and Wade and Rondo, you know, that team was horrific, but it's, I still support it. And when they decided to do the rebuild, my whole issue with rebuilding basketball is it does not guarantee that you're going to hit on a draft pick. Yeah. You, we've had this discussion before and what's been your prime example, the 76ers. Yeah. 76ers are how, how many top three picks have they had in the past decade? A lot. And one of them was Michael Carter Williams. (laughs) So they they really they've hit on one, they've hit on one, maybe two with Simmons. We don't know yet, but Joel Embiid, that's that's a one. But and he was injured a lot, so and they yeah they didn't know about him was, you know all the way through. But uh, they got a guy who thought it was a can't miss guy, and he forgot how to shoot. Um, it, yeah, so you you know you look at that, and they've got so many top three draft picks, top three, top five draft picks. And they've got a genuine superstar on their team. And, and even this year's pick Fultz. Oh, yeah, he's terrible. He's horrible. Um, and they they have the 10th worst record in, in basketball. They're a lottery team again. Now they they have a they're over five hundred now, aren't they? Oh. Uh, yeah, weren't they weren't they fighting for the playoffs? Yeah. Oh wait, I'm sorry. I was looking at the uh I was looking at Tankathon, so they have it's the uh they have the Lakers pick, so you're right. Um they they actually have the are in the they're thirty and twenty five. Wow. Yeah, but that's not gonna beat I mean they're not gonna beat any team in the East, let alone any of the top five teams in the West. I mean, you know, maybe they had some sort of semblance of hope before Cleveland you know, reshuffled the deck. <laughs> But yeah, they do, they're not going to do anything. Um, but still, like they're they're n- barely over five hundred, and with a decade of of you know top three picks. So the Bulls traded Jimmy Butler for three players that not many people you know had high ups high hopes for. Maybe maybe Zach Levine comes back from his injury. Um, but you look at that trade now, and I, you, I've heard you guys talk about this. I mean, the Bulls heavily like won that trade. Yeah, yeah. Even even if I Zach mean, Levine doesn't come back from that knee injury, you got to feel really comfortable with Larry Markkinen and Chris Dunn. Absolutely. And and I mean, you've you've seen you've seen a little bit of ups and downs with Zach Levine, but just his sheer athleticism. I see a lot of promise him. in him. I mean, just watching him play, you're like, I wish my body could do those things. So actually, let me let me rephrase this. When I say heavily, I mean, they got three legitimate starters, two really strong possibilities to be all-stars, maybe even a third. I mean, Chris Dunn may be, you know, I mean, that's it's really hard. I, I don't know if I see it right now, but I mean, to get that much back for Jimmy Butler. Well, look, look what Detroit had to give up to get Blake Griffin. And I mean, is, is Zach Levine when he's healthy going to be that different of a guy than, than Blake Griffin? I mean, from a scoring perspective, no. So it's, and you got him plus Chris Dunn plus Laurie Markin and, and, you didn't have to give up any draft assets. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, Alex, what's your perspective? I mean, I'm not a fan. Of, I mean, I'm more of a fan of letting these kids play and see what happens. And if it means we don't tank, we don't tank because I'm really impressed with them. Yeah. I mean, this is a really tough one because part of developing young assets is letting them play and letting them play to their full abilities. At the same time, though we can have this discussion again about the ethics of a tank, you know, I I understand that though there is nothing guaranteed in basketball or any sport really when you rebuild like this, it give like losing as much as you can gives you the best chance at building something. It's not guaranteed, but it gives you the best chance. I want to see this team play, the young kids play, but 
I'd also just really love to pray for losses. So I don't know how much of an approach you can take at this. I mean, obviously it would be resting guys on and off like they've been doing, not playing guys in big situations. I mean, that would be a true all-out tank. I think there's got to be some middle ground where you let your kids play, but you also kind of try to tank. And I, I don't know how realistic that is, but that's just kind of my desire, if that makes sense. Uh, I mean, they're going to have two first-round draft picks this year. Uh, Gary, Gary was frankly waving two fingers at me. And uh, and right now is that Pelicans pick, that, that might end up being a lottery pick. That would be so awesome if it is. Uh, right now, they're only a half game out of being a lottery pick. Uh, so it, there's a legit chance of that. Um, yeah, but you don't want it in the top five. Well, yeah, because then they don't. Yeah, it's definitely don't want top five, but the odds of top five, very, very slim. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm in the camp. You're right. I don't, I don't want to see, I want to see what these kids can do. And, and as great as Dunn has been and uh, the amazing things we've seen from Larry Markinen and, and the, 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 sh- the scoring and the athleticism of Zach Levine is it's, it's been a crime how, little those three have played together i mean how how many minutes even you can probably count how many minutes they've been on the floor together that's true that, that's the part that that is frustrating to me but the front office is definitely doing their part to to try to enhance their losing while still you know getting uh these young players to play is you know they've traded away um, Nico, who definitely was bringing them some victories. Um, Chris Dunn got a concussion and has been out for like six months now. It seems like <laughs> I mean, he comes in the first play, time he plays is over All Star the you know the Futures game. No, he played against Toronto. Did he? Yeah, he played. Okay. 20 yeah, minutes. he played. Um, I didn't see that game. Uh, Good. So <laughs> you've been you, playing that game, right? I don't know. I they were down by so much in the first quarter. I stopped paying attention. Yeah. So you're you're, you know, you rested uh, uh, Chris Dunn for a long time after a concussion, um, and and honestly, you've got the biggest trump uh, trump card in wild card or whatever you want to call it as far as tanking is. You've got arguably the worst player in the NBA on your team. Yeah, campaign. buddy. Cameron Payne, oh, yeah, the ultimate get, tank man. He's getting some playing time the second half of the year. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, him playing is just getting you extra losses. But I really do want to see, you know, a guy that we talked about a few minutes ago is Cristiano Felicio. I really want to see him play because the guy who earned that contract that he got um, was a hustle and. Uh, he was a hustle guy. He was a hardworking guy. And, you know, I, I don't know where the, the train came off the tracks, but you would like to see him get back into it because if if you can get him playing to where he was, that, that adds to a heck of a, you know, possible bench in the future. Maybe he just needs to run up on uh, Bobby Portis and get punched, come back and look like a stud again. You there, Alex? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just, you know, these kids need to play, but there's the front office definitely has uh, tools to to help make sure that they, they keep paces with the uh, the Orlandos and the, the Memphises and the Phoenixes. Yeah, all that. A little change of subject. I want to get your guys' opinion on something. Have you guys noticed that in the media, John Paxson has been more of a focal point, and Gar uh, Foreman has kind of been doing more scouting and hasn't been in front of a camera. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've heard more of John Paxson this season than I probably have the last three seasons combined. I mean, heard, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. Been very, very vocal. Uh, and that's, that's weird because if you think about it is a couple seasons ago, when they did the end of the year press conference and they just stunk, they did it like late at night, 
during like a playoff game of a uh, Blackhawks and oh, I remember that. I think, I think yeah. the White Sox had something going on. Uh, so there was all kinds of other stuff going on that people were watching, and they were like, "Quick, let's do a quick press conference where nobody's going to ask questions." I'm pretty sure it was known as the Dog Turd Press Conference on 670 The Score or something of that nature. So, it, you know, it's it's good that maybe they, they actually did do some fundamental changes in that front office. And adding Doug Collins can't can't have hurt anything because he he's a guy that's, that's not going to be uh, – if he's got something to say, everybody's going to hear it. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I can't even remember the last time I heard from Gar Foreman. Like, I, I really can't. Was it the draft, maybe? Because after that, I, I don't even remember hearing from him. When the whole Nico and uh, Bobby Portis thing, I didn't hear from Gar. I just heard from John. You know, every time I hear Gar Foreman's voice, I just, in my head, he always looks like a toad man. He looks like he's got a human body but a toad head. That's I don't know why. It's just that's exactly what I'm picturing and him talking with a toad mouth. Ribbit. <laughs> uh but yeah, I, I Gary, you were saying something before. You thought that the NBA was actually going to change the the way they do drafting. Yeah, I was I don't know like what it is, but I thought this was the last year they were going to follow a certain system and there was going to be a new system next year. I'm not sure what it is, though. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that as well. Yeah, I mean, to go for this full circle on the on the tanking thing is, uh, you know, baseball, I don't know, tanking is, is hard because it, the players are so far away from making the major league level and the 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 rate of the hit rate is so low that you know it doesn't really matter as far as what your draft you know picks are but basketball and basketball is the one sport where you can easily change an entire franchise with uh one season of tank i mean think about think about the lebron draft that absolutely changed the the course and history of the nba and um, you know, if you've got a guy like that, is is, t- is you're gonna have you're gonna have half dozen or a whole dozen teams just going out intentionally losing games. So you're you're right, something's got to be done, and it's there's uh, there's pros and cons to every situation, and and the way it is now, I think it's a little frustrating just because it really does reward teams for being terrible. Yeah, it's just it's the whole concept of trying to lose. And I could imagine that if you're on a rebuilding or tanking team and you're asked to not play to your full abilities or you're not allowed to play to your full abilities, I would imagine that that's very, very frustrating for a lot of players. At the same time, you look at sports these days, it's all about building young from the ground up. That's just how it is. And until they change the course tanking is it seems like it's just going to be part of it that's how you're going to get a lot of draft picks that's how you're going to get a lot of young assets but i'll always say that when it comes to tanking the nba is where you see like the traditional tanking because like we said with baseball you know the the draft order doesn't always matter as much because there's lots of hits and misses, and that's more of a front office thing where they're just like, "All right, we're doing too good. We're gonna keep drafting. We're gonna or we're gonna keep trading away so we can get some more young assets and start losing some more this season." And in hockey, like you're either good or you're not good. And same with football. If you're a bad team, then you're just gonna be a bad team. And oftentimes, a lot of bad teams have injuries, so. Now, I, I personally, I think basketball is where you see like the traditional tanking the most. Well, and basketball is is basically, for the most part, uh, it's two well, it's two rounds of, of the draft, and for the most part, if you're not in the first round, you're you right. probably stink. And it's very superstar uh, driven. As, I mean, as much as NBA players stink, yeah, and it's it's a team where you nowadays you need at least at least two superstars right. to win a title but it's you know Gary's holding up 
three fingers. And I'm saying at the bare minimum, you need two because last year, uh, Kyrie and LeBron almost won. And there's only two superstars. And do not call Kevin Love a superstar. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you 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 need a bare minimum of two. And, and one of those two better be LeBron James. Uh, but, or, or has been LeBron James. Or has been LeBron James. But you almost yeah. need three superstars. And and superstars, for the most part, are top 10 picks. So it just get it. You have to get it. If you don't get a top 10 pick, then you know you might as well be the Bulls and sell your second round yeah, pick for exactly. three and a half million dollars. Which I still maintain is as mad as I was about that is I I like I mean they ended up with David Nawaba who kind of I kind of like and they bought out uh, Rajon Rondo's contract with that money. Yeah, they did. But I I wish they would have kept him too. You want Rondo back? Um, I, he would have been awesome for helping Chris Dunn develop. Yeah, I guess I just I, I was fine with them getting rid of all those I, guys. I, I, I hated Rajon Rondo when he was wearing a Celtics uniform, but after that, I always loved Rajon Rondo, and I, I did a complete 180 on him. And I, as a bull, like I still want to go out and find. I probably can get one on eBay for like eight dollars, but I want to get a Rondo jersey. Well, it was fun watching him the first two games of the first round last year. It was fun to watch. I'll give him that. I still and think he, he's a royal pain in the ass, but you know. You know what is if you listen to the young players, they all said he was the best teammate that he'd ever had. P- young players loved him. Coaching staff and front office hated his guts. Yeah. And, su- and superstars hated him too. Well, because that's because he had no problems calling out Dwayne Wade and Jimmy Butler in media and calling them by name. <laughs> he had no problems. And those guys needed it because to be honest, is they both overpaid and underperformed. Do you know, Which I got a, a signed. Sorry, I was gonna say I got a signed picture of Jimmy Dwayne Wade and Rajon Rondo at Family Fest Day f- for the Bulls for a dollar. Who signed it though? <laughs> Gar Foreman signed it. I got a picture of. I got a picture of the the three alphas and Gar Foreman signed it. <laughs> uh, true. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you again, Alex. Oh, it's fine. It's it's hard to do this over the internet when you're not looking at each other. Um, who was, who was the speedy guy that the White Sox had in the, the nineties? Um, Lance Johnson, Lance Johnson. So that, did the Cubs. Yeah. yeah. It was on the 90s. So true story. True story is, uh, I was at the Chicago Ridge mall one day. Um, and, I was walking in the parking lot and I found an autographed picture of him in his socks uniform. It was like a headshot. And it was actual his autograph. It was just laying on the <laughs> ground. And I was like, <laughs> wow. Somebody somebody was like, bah, who cares? And just chucked that out of their car window. Come on. The one dog was great. Uh, Lance Johnson was a pretty solid man. player, though, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he uh, interesting, useless stat about him. He led the American League in hits, and then the following year, he went to the Mets and led the National League in hits. I did not know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> Baseball is full of like just absolute weird trivia type it really things. Is. It is such a stat driven sport that. Um, what was your other one that you you texted me the other day? Uh, uh, oh yeah. It's not a good one for the White Sox, but uh, the White Sox made history in the last two years. Uh, they have the only two players in baseball history to play a full season and strike out over 160 times and walk less than 20 times. The past two years? And that's Matt. Yes. Matt Davidson and Tim Anderson. No other players in the history of baseball have, wow. have that. Wow. Stat. Yeah, that's that's not a good stat for for White Sox fans. Um, but you know, while we're on White Sox, and Alex and I are, uh, um, uh, Alex and I are both Cubs fans. Gary Gary's a White Sox fan, which is weird because I'm from 
I'm from the south side and Gary's from the north side. Uh, so we both grew up with surrounded by fans of the opposing team, which was, I don't know about your situation, but it was not fun growing up a Cubs fan in White Sox country. Probably was not the same. Uh, it wasn't the same. I think everyone assumed I was a Cubs fan. So, <laughs> But while we have you here, I'm interested to hear because the, I mean, the White Sox definitely are not going to compete for the World Series this year. But one of the fun things will be spring training and seeing who's going to win out in these position battles and what their rotation is going to look like. Um, I kind of want to get your input on what what you think is your starting pos- fielders are going to be and what your what your five man rotation is going to be. Okay, um, pitching. I th- I think the rotation is actually pretty much set, barring you know someone coming up and having a just. A ridiculous spring training. That's James Shields, uh, Gonzalez, Fulmer, uh, Lopez, and Giolito. Um, I know Rodon has been throwing, but I think he's going to start the season in a DL. Yeah, I, I heard that he might miss the like a, a big chunk of the beginning of the season. Is that guy ever going to be healthy? Uh, probably the year of his contract. <laughs> It, I mean, the, the crazy part is, is if you're judging him just on the stuff that he throws, he's, I mean, he probably had better stuff than Chris Sale. I mean, if just the pure that slider. Oh, yeah, he doesn't have good slider. You know, Sale has a nasty slider. But Rodon has, I mean, his control sucks, but he's got some nasty stuff. Like, he if, does. If that guy could get his command issues together and be healthy, I mean, that is a hell of a pitcher there. Yeah, but he's a he's a he's a Boris. <laughs> well, then you just tra- you trade him away for prospects. I'm I'm not, I guess I'm not as worried if if he succeeds, great. If he doesn't, okay, because the White Sox have so much pitching depth in their system right now that you know it's not the end of the world if he doesn't. I guess. Yeah, that's that's a good point you make there because Carlos Rodon was part of the the pre Han rebuild, and you have so many other riches now where the pre Han rebuild guys, even if they don't work out, you can kind of survive going forward. Yeah, I mean the White Sox have such a deep farm system, and it's not it's not position heavy either, like. Uh, you know, there's there's some teams that have good prospects, but it'll be like they have eight outfielder prospects, and that's it. The White Sox have such spread out wealth in the minor league system. Even if they have a mediocre hit rate of maybe one out of three, they still are going to have a, a lot of talent that hits the major league level. Mm-hmm. Um, so my big question: Who's going to be your center fielder? <laughs> um, I mean, and do and do I have a chance? If I show up in a jersey, do I have a chance? Uh, I honestly don't know. Probably I have a committee. depth chart here. Um, there's three. There's three guys on it right now. Who Who are the three that are listed on there? So number one on the depth chart is Adam Engel. Number two is Leori Garcia. And number three is Charlie Tilson. Gary, I don't know if you think any of those guys will be around long or you'll want them to be around long. What's your take on that? I think the only one that stands a chance only because we don't know what he can do yet is Tilson. I think Engel, you know, I was listening to some uh, a podcast about how Adam Engel worked on his swing all winter and he's going to be a different hitter and like, well maybe he's a double a hitter then <laughs> I, I, you know what you know what's gonna be funny is all three of those guys are going to be trivia questions when the white Sox are competing for world series they're like uh in the 2018 season who are the three center fielders that the white Sox <laughs> had and they're like um uh <laughs> so basically whoever it is is just keeping a seat warm for luis robert yeah <laughs> until he eventually gets up there um, and then, uh, right field is Garcia. If, uh, if they don't trade him, I don't think they'll trade him. I think they're going to, I he, think he won his arbitration case. Yeah. You know, it's still 
peanuts to what if what players are making. So um, left field, uh, uh, Dom, uh, Nikki Delmonico, I think we'll get. That's it. What he's listed he's, number one on the depth chart. <laughs> he's a horrible left fielder, but I mean, you know, he can hit. Um, he's 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 one of those blue collar guys that Chicago. Yeah, you have love. to like him. Yeah, he's like the Tom Waddle of your team. Um, uh, Sanchez at third, Anderson at shortstop, um, uh, Mankata at second, Abreu uh, at first, and uh, you think Mankata starts the season in the majors? Yeah, he had like two hundred and thirty bats say, last year. I mean, did, did he get? Did he? Have, I, I didn't. I didn't remember how many he had. Um, yeah, for like the last two and a half months. Okay, I didn't know if they brought him up in time to they could uh, shove him back down. All right, so we got Mankata, and, and then who's going to catch? Hi, uh, former Cub, uh, Wellington Castillo. Castillo. <laughs> they, the White Sox, White Sox love to sign former they like Cubs to catcher. Sign former Cubs, yeah. Why not? He was. Uh, um, bullpen. And who and who closes for this team? Soria, because they got to up his trade value for the line. So yeah, it, it, that was a great trade, by the way, to get uh, Soria and that guy from LA uh, for bullpen help for basically a guy that would never make it to the majors that wasn't even on their forty man roster. Um, was I don't Jake even know Peters, the guy's name. Was. Yeah, I mean. Uh, what I like about the White Sox this year is you're going to start seeing, uh, you know, them slowly introduce the the young the young players that you're you're excited about. I mean, they already have. Well, you're going to start seeing more. I mean, Eloy Jimenez is, keeps talking how his goal is to make the the, the roster this year. Um, and- he's not going to make it, but he's going to be called up. And that trade, probably, I've never. Seen a trade benefit both the Cubs yes. and the Sox like that trade has. It really, I, you know, I a lot of Cubs fans get mad about it, and we we talked about this in last week or the week before, um, and I don't understand it because uh, is a, a good trade is you, you can't just fleece everybody. People just don't want to trade with you anymore. But it, a, the good trade benefits both sides. You have to give something to get something, and the Cubs gave up an awful lot, but they got an awful lot. They got a really good pitcher who is making, as far as pitchers goes, peanuts. He's a top fifteen pitcher in the league, and and he's making what seven million a year? Yeah, about eight point eight five. His contract is criminal for what he's done. You guys could thank Rick Hahn for that. Rick Hahn is a smart man. Is is I think I told you before, Gary. Is when uh, when. Uh, the Cubs were looking for a new general manager is before the, you know, Jed and Theo came in the picture is I really wanted Rick Hahn. I, I, he, he's a really smart baseball man and, and look what he's doing with the White Sox and their limited payroll. Imagine what he could do if he had, you know, if, if uh, ownership would open up the the pocketbooks when it's time. And, um, and they say they will, they're going to, be very similar to what the Cubs did when they went out and got John Lester. They're going to start opening up the pockets next year. So they mean they're going to sign Kershaw? No, I actually think they're going to go for um, uh, what's his name on Baltimore. The, who, who you thought they were, yeah, Machado, uh, Machado. Who you thought they were going to trade for? I didn't think that. I just I saw enough reports where it was it was it went from I don't understand this to. I don't know. It's enough people are saying it that it makes me curious of what's going on. I, I said this, Gary and I talk sports a lot offline. Um, and, and I, I just didn't understand the, the White Sox, you know, interest in Moncada. I mean, Moncada. Mo, so it's, it's Manny Machado, late. sorry, Manny Machado. Uh, they uh, is, is long-term. Oh yeah. They would love to have him long-term, but, to trade a lot to get him for one year and he's going to go to the open market. That doesn't make any sense. I'm guessing they were. Sorry. Yeah. That never made any sense to me. I'm guessing they were offering players that weren't in their top 10 prospects for him. 
eh, it's possible. And then people just ran with it because they were like, oh, White Sox are putting a package together. Uh, I mean, the Cubs, I could I could see them even as a one-year rental because that bat in the lineup, even if you have to give up a bunch for them for one year, that just makes your, your offensive lineup just stupid good. So speaking of Cubs and Sox, I sent you a text earlier. Are we living like upside down land where, or upside down world, uh, where the Cubs are on sixty seven hundred or the score, and the Sox are on WGN? It, it is weird, um, and but I, I don't know. WGN I thought was is good for the the Cubs, so I hope it's a uh, I hope it works out well for the White Sox. It is kind of weird what a flip that was. Think about it. in twenty fourteen, it was the other way around. I'm curious is is I I don't think I listen to any basketball on the radio. Where did the Bulls start the season on the radio? They were both Sox and Bulls were both on 8900 and I was talking to a fellow Sox fan it's like, you know, that's a dangerous station. I don't know if you guys listen to it, but if you leave the game on and you come back to it a few hours after the game and some of the talk radio that's on that station, it's wasn't good. I'm pretty happy both teams. It was not a good situation for either team. It yeah. really wasn't. Because like the Bulls mid season went to uh the score. Well that's because eighty uh, they was they did they, they their contracts both contracts at the same time were um were I guess ended because the Yeah. I forgot what the reason was. Maybe I don't know if bankruptcy was involved or uh, something. Okay, because uh. yeah, because it was weird for them mid season, like bef- right before the All Star break, yep. to be like, "Oh, hey, we're on the score starting uh, like tomorrow." <laughs> uh, well, they had to add facts. I'm sorry, they had to act fast. Uh, the Sox had some time to kind of f- figure it out. Yeah, but it's it. You know, the WGN situation will be good. Uh, it's it was it was really good for the Cubs. I mean, um, like honestly. I think I might. I think. I think. I don't know. I. I like them being on, on WGM better than the score, but uh, it's it's good station, and they were they did the Cubs well for a long time. So I hopefully it's it's a good situation for the White Sox. So are either of you season ticket holders for the Cubs? I'm not season ticket holder for anything because no. I'm cheap. I'm cheap. <laughs> um, a little little tidbit about being a season ticket holder for the Sox. They changed their packages. We had a great package for many years. It was a 27 game package every Saturday and Sunday home game. And they changed it to 20 game packages. And you had a choice between Friday night and Saturdays or Saturday or some day during the week and Sundays. So, and then they tried to move our seats higher up and we kind of, you know, talked to them about that. But I mean, it really, one of the things I always, tell Sean about for cup fans is how you guys had to endure higher ticket costs, how you guys had to basically do what, do what you could just to go to games because the organization was making money off it. Um, And I feel like that starting there are signs of that for the white Sox. I'm a little nervous about that. Yeah. And you know, especially if they get good again, uh, yeah, once once the White Sox are are competing, um, you're going to see the fan the fans come back to the ballpark, and it's gonna they're going to drive the price back up. Is you know they did these cool things with when Sale was pitching, and they had the the shirts that went with the ticket package, and um, and those were just you had to do something to get butts in the seats because is for good or bad. White Sox fans, when they they don't put a good product in the field, they show up or they show their their anger by not going to the stadium. Cubs, uh, you know, there's always enough people that. I mean, I know I know a lot of times I'll go to a Cubs game because I have friends in town from other places. And they're like, I want to go to a Cubs game. Okay, let's go to the Cubs game, and uh, you know, I would say like a third of the stadium is full of people that that are just like, I want to go to a game at Wrigley Field and I'm from out of town or I'm not a baseball fan. I just, it's cool to go to Wrigley Field. So you have this built-in crowd of people that just show up every single day, you know, win, lose, or draw. And and that's in some way, I mean, for a long time, that was awful for the Cubs because they had no motivation to be competitive. The White Sox, it's a motivator because you're like, well, we got to be good if we want 
we, we want to crack, uh, you know, our attendance mark. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope, you know, I get made fun of a lot because of the attendance. Um, and I get it. I make fun of you for the attendance. I mean, I get it, but I'm, I'm not the person that we should be making fun of because I actually go to <laughs> games, but, um, you know, I, I want there to be more people. The stadium is more exciting when more people are there. And I, I think, I think everyone's, at least from a fan perspective, everyone's all aboard with the direction they're headed to, you know, and, and it should, I think it will be fun. And, you know, one day all of us can go to a, uh, um, an L world series. That, that would be awesome. Is or get out of this. Yeah, city. I might choose the second one. I don't <laughs> it, want to. It, die. It's funny because <laughs> is uh, I remember when the the Mets and the Yankees played in the World Series, and New Yorkers were like, "This is the World Series everybody wanted to see," and then everybody else was like, "Yeah, no, nobody wants to see this outside of New York," uh, and and I used to think Chicago was like, "Everybody wants to see the Cubs or the Sox," and then I realized nobody wants to see that. No, I actually, you know, I've talked to you about this before. I actually. One of the worries I had for Cup fans when they finally would win a World Series was that they would become Red Sox fans, and I can honestly say that that didn't happen. I think Cup fans are appreciative of of that, and now it seems like it would be cool to have an all Chicago World Series, not for anyone else, but for for us because we've had so many years of losing between the two teams. It would be just cool because there'd be so many homegrown or. Uh... I mean, I consider anybody. You home- Darvish is not homegrown. Yeah, but I mean, uh, Chris Bryant and uh, yeah. Kyle Schwarber, and I, I mean, I even almost count Anthony Rizzo, even though I mean, he definitely started with other programs, but they they brought him as it wasn't like they signed him as a superstar. He was he was a guy that was batting like two hundred and striking out a whole lot, and you know they they fostered him in there. Wilson Contreras and Javi Baez and Addison Russell and. Um, you know, you'll have Moncada, who I'll consider a, a homegrown guy because you, you know, you you brought him into the farm system and then brought him up. Um, and Moncada is basically Rizzo because when he started his big league career, it was with another team and they had pretty much like the same number of service time, which was like not much at all. But you're going to associate him coming up with the White Sox more than the Red Sox. And that's the same thing with Rizzo, the Padres, and the Cubs. Yeah, and you're going to have Eloy Jimenez and, you're, you know, uh, Michael Kopech and Lucas Giolito. And it's going to be all these guys that, that you had in your minor league system that came up, and it's going to be exciting to see. It's not going to be like Yankees-Mets where it's just like, yeah, we've got, you know, all these guys that we paid top dollar for bringing us to the World Series. No, yeah, it'll be fun, and I'm I'm looking forward to both teams being good. I think uh, I think the days of Cubs and White Sox fans fighting are gone. I mean, remember that one Cubs Sox game we went to? That a bunch of fights broke out. Yeah, um, I, I just was that in the late two thousands by any chance? Um, I think early. Yeah, I think it I think it was before the White Sox won. Yeah, it was definitely before the White Sox won. I I, okay. I would like to think that the game that AJ Przinsky got clocked was the last game where fans really took the, the you know the comp- competition between the two seriously, and then it sort of like, that was ugly. Yeah, I, no one remembers the score of the game either. I mean, I know what happened, but like, wait, there was a score. Wait, what? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I just thought there was just a Thunderdome that day at U.S. Taylor Field, and everyone was in on it. The White Sox won 12-3. to <laughs> It wasn't even close, but oh. <laughs> no one remembers yeah. that because Michael Barrett clocked 18 Brzezinski. Man, those two really hated each other. And, but, man, A.J. Brzezinski, like, even after, like, listening to it afterwards, he's just like, what? Why would anybody hate me? And he's just, <laughs> it, you're just like, man, I hate you just from, even if I had no opinion before, like, listening to you, just like, like pretend like nobody, you know, you don't understand why people hate you. Makes me want to hate you. I would put money on it. If you met AJ <laughs> Przinsky at a bar, you would love him and have a great time. <laughs> probably. Like probably. Uh, but I mean, that's a guy who, if he was on your team, you loved him. And if you played against him, you hated his guts. Yeah. I, I mean, there's plenty of guys like that in the league. I mean, who do you think was hated more in the league? 
Jeff Kent or AJ Brzezinski? <laughs> Who had a worse stash? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I mean, Jeff Kent's teammates hated him. How Jeff Kent is not a Hall of Famer? Just because I, he, everybody hates him doesn't matter. It it, it does when you're voted in. <sighs> Different topic. Sorry. Now here's. Here's something interesting, and Gary, I don't know if you were at this game. Were you a, a, a big uh, season ticket holder still in uh, 2014? Yeah. Okay, so that year, me and some friends went to the Crosstown game. It was the first game at U.S. Cellular Field, Cubs and White Sox, and it was the lowest attended Crosstown game in history. And it was such a far cry from what it was yep. 10 years prior because both teams were bad. Both teams were really, really bad. And what would be cool to see is that you see the hype, you see the sold-out crowds at both stadiums when both teams are good, but there's not that like killing and clawing and destroying of each other like we saw in the mid two thousands. I would assume you were at that game, or you know, maybe I, I don't know. So I stopped going. And this is gonna sound horrible. I stopped going to Crosstown Classics because I took my son to one. And a White Sox fan was just mouthing off to a Cubs fan. And I'm like, no, nah, I got a I can't kid. blame like, you. I can't yeah, blame it, you. I, I think that 2014 game was like a perfect storm of both teams sucked. And I, th- and I think like to Gary's point is a lot of regular attendees were just like, I, I don't want to go. I'll watch on TV. I don't want to go to a Cubs, like a Crosstown Classic because that it's going to be too ugly. I'm not going to bring my family. I'm not going to go there and and wind up getting into a fight or getting a beer thrown at me or, you know, slurs and uh, slung at me. And and especially for two teams that suck. And But hopefully that's changed. Now that both teams have won a World Series, I think the fans are a little more mature. Yeah, I mean... I hope so. I I truly do. There's one one thing to be like, you know, like I'm not a White Sox fan, you know, or I'm not a Cubs fan and I root for my team and and I don't, I don't root for them. Eh, whatever, that's f- fine. But I mean, at this point, you know, the the actual hatred. I, th- I think it's there's going to be always be those meatballs. But I think, I think, and hope that it's that's subsiding. I was happy when the Cubs won. Well, I was upset for different reasons, but I was happy the Cubs won, when the Cubs won a World Series for you, so that you ex- could experience that. I was upset because fireworks started going off at midnight and woke me and my wife up. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, but I was happy for all my friends that were diehard baseball fans that were able to see what I saw. And we don't get to see this. There's generations from both of us who have not seen this. And yeah. you guys were, and I was happy for you. Uh, a good friend of mine um, passed away uh, this past year and uh, um, I remember when the Cubs won the next day he tweeted or I don't know if he posted on Facebook or he tweeted but um, he was like I'm not happy because every Cubs fan I know wasn't a Cubs fan two years ago and he's like except for Sean Hobman because he's like I remember he's like I remember the Bartman year when he just broke down in tears when they they lost and he's like I saw that pain and emotion he's like I'm happy for him oh I told my wife I loved her for the first time when the White Sox won the World Series I get it <laughs> yeah. which is really Really, not the best way to tell your future wife that you love her when you're crying like a baby at the United Center because your team won the World Series. She just laughed at me. Oh, were you at yeah, one I, of those watch I remember. parties or whatever that they had? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was actually pretty cool to open up the second floor of, or 200 level of the United Center. We went there. And the thing is, those yeah, World when, Series when the- parties probably outdrew the Blackhawks at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. Uh, but yeah, when the when the Cubs won, is I, I burst into tears, and and my daughter was sleeping, and she came downstairs, and uh, she's like, she's like, Daddy, why are you crying? And and then gave me a, she's like, I'll give you a big hug. And I was just like, little does she know, I'm crying because I'm happy, and <laughs> having your kid hug you, and your team win the World Series first time in your entire life, and it was just like the craziest experience. Yeah, actually, you got you got to. It happened. We were what, 21, 22? Yeah, I was twenty two when it happened. Yeah, we let's see. I was. Oh, I was like two thousand five. Uh, 
27? Something like that. 27, yeah. That was 40. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we had the like Bulls. The so that's the other thing. You're Sorry to point out your age, but we, we went through the Bulls six championships at prime of like high school yeah. and college years. I, so I saw Bears Super Bowl. Yeah, I saw Bears Super Bowl too. So it's hard to complain, but Sean and mine's favorite sport is still baseball. And so to finally see our teams win, it was. It was yeah, great. I mean, th- those Bulls teams, I was four the last one they won. I really don't remember it. So my first like true memories were the Hawks Stanley Cups, and that was a big deal. Like, huge Hawks fan. So incredibly happy when the Hawks won those Cups but nothing compared to a World Series. It just, because baseball is my favorite sport as well. And obviously with the Cubs and the White Sox, and even technically the Hawks when they first won theirs, there was the whole thing about a long, long drought ending. And though baseball isn't like the dominant game in America anymore, for so many years it was. And for so many years, neither the Cubs or the White Sox won anything. So that was kind of special. Yeah, my only regret of the White Sox winning is that Stephen Perry is attached to it. <laughs> well, we've got Eddie Vedder attached to ours. Uh, anyways, if I never have to hear "Don't Stop Believing" again, I will be the happiest person in the world. Yeah, it is funny as as a young lad watching the the Bears win a Super Bowl. I was like, "This is awesome! I can't wait to see more of these in my uh, life." <laughs> Well, you do realize Chicago in the last 25 years or since 1990 is one of the most winning cities. Yeah. I think Boston's the only one that's won more. Yeah, but still, it's not enough. Not enough. (laughs) Okay, Red Sox fan. (laughs) Oh, woe is me. Now I'm the best. Uh, But I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, Unless anybody has anything else they want to add. Well, I just want to thank you both for letting me come here. That, that was really it was great appreciate. having you. Hey, glad to have you. Yeah, it's always great to, to talk baseball with a White Sox fan because <laughs> Gary's the one that said that we didn't talk enough White Sox. So, well, I mean, <laughs> it, it's yeah. hard as we're both Cubs fans. So it's like, it was just that the, so, you didn't mention anything about Sox fans. <laughs> and I'm just saying, well, you know, that is a kind of. Esteban Loaiza was there. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> Drug Lord. The amount the drugs that are. too. My goodness. I didn't... I, you know what's funny is is I like how everybody reported is you know 99 out of 100 times when they talk about like drug score, it's always in kilos. But there every single story was like in pounds because it just didn't nobody knows what a kilogram is. And they're yeah, like 44. Well, four, 44 pounds. And <laughs> Because useless fact about us, Ron Loiza, he was traded to the Yankees the <laughs> day of his bobblehead. <laughs> That's great. That's Saddest great. bobblehead day ever. I wish I wish Brent Seabrook got traded on his bobblehead oh, day. Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to uh, thank Gary for being on the show, and I want to thank everybody for listening. Um, Please make sure you hit subscribe, however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or the TuneIn app, which I found out that uh, you can listen to the show through, which I have on my TV. Um, So hit subscribe, share with your friends. Thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the Bears go Bears!